Okay, so uh, every class I like to give an opportunity for people to ask questions. In this case, we're early enough that a lot of them are logistical questions, uh, but I don't want to restrain it to that. So in just a moment, I will allow you to ask any questions that you have. I certainly have enough to talk about to keep us going the whole period. Uh, first uh, question of my own, is that, does anyone have difficulty seeing that font? Do I need to make it bigger for anyone? I normally make it quite a bit bigger, but people tell me it's overkill when I go for the, the big one-ton characters. Is that all right for the folks in the back? Yeah? Okay. So uh, regarding the announcements, I wanted to, I don't have it, where do I have it? I have it on... Uh, Oh, this doesn't work. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm not. I won't bring it up. But I can bring up the other browser. Bring it up. But so I imagine that you all have been getting Piazza emails as people have been posting and so forth. That is something you can tune for the frequency with which you re, uh, receive them and for what you receive them for. So uh, if you're getting too many or you're getting them too frequently or not frequently enough. Maybe you want hourly updates regardless of whether or not anything's been posted. I'm sure that's a setting that you can set in Piazza. In, in there I did post an announcement on 111 that, or excuse me, 111X, uh, which will hold its first meeting, I want to say Wednesday at 4 p.m. Does that sound right for anyone that saw that? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so if you're thinking about doing that, go ahead and block out some time Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, again, it's certainly possible that'll end up being the time all semester long. However, Andreas will give an opportunity to kind of get together with everyone that shows up there as long as from the other 111 sections uh, to see if a better time works for everyone. Um, so then we can start rolling that class now. I'm sorry, say that again? Yes, now would be the time to enroll in that class, absolutely. Also, I wanted to, yes? Uh, let me, let me ring up my other browser here. It is in Piazza. Okay. Yeah. And let me see if I type 111x here in the search box. There we go. Yeah, so, so you'll find it posted in there. And then again, as a reminder for uh, getting from this Blackboard course shell to Piazza, you just have to click the questions and answers link. Uh, I want to go ahead and review again where we are at as far as what you should be doing in this course shell. I'm not, I'm not entirely happy with the way I have it organized, so I may over time make adjustments to make things a little bit more obvious. But that said, let me uh, refresh you as to the state of things. Uh, I am posting daily announcements that'll pop up when you log in. Uh, it's also this daily diatribe link will bring that up. So I've only had two formal announcements. The assignments directory is where assignments and projects are done. Uh, assignment one is a little bit quirky and some of these assignments will be a little bit quirky so this is going to be generally true at least in the short term until I find a, a better architecture. Uh, there's going to be a write-up of some sort beginning the assignment. Normally these are coding assignments, yes, where you write C++ code and so your deliverable for the assignment will be a text file, not with a .txt extension by the way, text file in the sense that it's human readable. Uh, a human readable C++ file that you will then at the bottom here, it has assignment one submission, you will go there and using uh, number two here, 
uh, browse my computer to go ahead and find that file that you wrote up and submit it for the assignment. On these assignments, uh, there are sometimes worries that you, you submit it and then you discover you did something wrong and you want to make a correct, correction or resubmit it. That's fine. And there's a setting in there that I have set to unlimited submissions within the, the, the due date. Yes. So if you submit 20 of them, that's fine. All I do is I look at the most recent one you submitted and I ignore all the others. So go ahead and, and submit those assignments as frequently as you like. Uh, then the, the quirky thing about it is that I, I, what I'm trying to do more this semester, particularly in the front end of the semester, is provide some additional scaffolding for you. And I've called this content overview and quiz. Uh, so at this stage in the game, what I am interested in you doing is becoming a little bit more proficient with these basic Unix slash Linux commands. Again, I'm going to use the words Unix and Linux. I don't want to say Unix slash Linux whole semester. So if I say one or the other, they're, they're equivalent. Um, now I need you to get more familiar with these beyond simply watching anything I do in class and beyond simply you doing enough to create a directory for uh, your assignments. The, it just makes things go a lot smoother if you're able to navigate around the operating system successfully at the command prompt. Uh, have some resources there. You can read that, what I'm asking you to do with the resources. Again, this is in lieu of the textbook. I'm trying to direct you to some specific things on the web. And some things to try. So this is not exhaustive. It isn't every possible thing that I necessarily would like you to know. But to, to kind of cue you to, to really experiment, whether it's for five minutes or for an hour and a half, experiment with some of these commands and getting familiar with them. And then I have a little quiz here. So this is my way of ensuring that you're taking at least a little bit extra time to learn and understand this stuff. Again, the quiz is not hard. You can come back to it. Um, it's multiple choice. Uh, I just m want to make you aware that it is here. So again, it's in the assignments directory, in this case in the assignment 01 folder, and in there is another folder which is content overview and quiz. You should expect to see assignment two. You should, would have an assignment two submission, and you should also have a content overview and quiz inside of assignment two. Okay. Uh, the other thing to keep track of is this thing that I mentioned about the secret word quizzes for having a combination of giving you the flexibility to miss a class or two and yet giving me some confidence that you're being accountable and are either attending lecture or watching them online. Uh, so we did one for Wednesday. I'm going to do another one for Friday. In fact, why don't we do that now? Otherwise, I'll definitely forget. Today's magic word is platinum. So write it down. Uh, I do have the quiz out there right now. If you have some sort of smart device, feel free to go in there and take that quiz while I talk. Uh, so again, the, I, I, for the due dates of these, since I don't have, I have people on the wait list, I've got these pushed out a week or two on the due dates. They will shrink in to where uh, they, these will essentially disappear at the start of the next lecture. So if you miss Monday, fine. Be sure and watch that screencast prior to the beginning of Wednesday's lecture. Yes? If, and, and of course I'm flexible, so maybe you're, you're uh, on some sporting team here and you're going to be out of town for a couple class times, all you have to do is just send me an email or come see me and, and I'll work with you and uh, slip you the secret word, which you can then charge money for. <clears throat> all right, so I think that about does it for the administrivia. Another thing I do want to mention, a couple more things, is uh, I did say to some folks yesterday, and I may have even said Wednesday, that prior to me talking right this moment, I would have assignment two up. Uh, I just got have gotten slammed over the last 36 hours or so, so I'm going to endeavor to get that up uh, prior to the weekend. So you can look forward to that. The due date for assignment two is going to be beyond the first set of labs next week. Uh, the first set of labs, however, will not be dedicated towards working on assignment two. I have a different kind of pair up, small group activity I want to do in the labs this uh, Monday and Tuesday. 
the other thing is some of you may have noticed in Piazza, people asking questions. Uh, they've got some C++ code. And uh, I imagine for some of you that's causing a little bit of panic, like I haven't even looked at one line of C++ code and these people are putting small programs up. Uh, am I really over my head? Uh, I would say no. Uh, these, it, these are just people who are, you know, going a little bit further and or they may have a little bit of experience and they're just jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, I do not have any expectations that you've written a single line of C++ code to this point. If you have, great. Uh, if you haven't, that's fine. All right, so that's all I have for announcements. And before I start talking about various things, uh, does anyone want to ask me any questions about anything at all? Yes? When you were typing earlier. Oh, when I was typing earlier, yes. <clears throat> So, when I'm inside of, of Vim here, uh, we know that J goes down, K goes up, L goes to the right, uh, H goes to the left. What are other commands I gave you? I gave you the letter X to delete a character. Uh, GG, yeah, so some people who came to lab yesterday got a couple things that I didn't necessarily... Uh, didn't, that don't benefit the people that are in the Monday, Wednesday lab. Uh, GG goes to the top of the file. Uppercase G goes to the bottom of the file. Um, a and I, right, for getting into insert mode, either A or I, and then to get out of insert mode, you hit the escape. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just throw one more at you at random, and that is, let me just put it here, CW means change word. So what I can do is I can go and what that means is it will change from where my cursor is to the end of what this editor perceives as a word. And a word generally is delineated by either white space or by some sort of punctuation. So if I was to change word here it would change cache and it would stop at the colon. So CW, you'll note it here at the bottom that it's gone into insert mode. So this is a way of getting into insert mode, and I can type away. And then again, in order to get back to command mode, you just hit escape, right? Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to be revisiting this editor uh, all semester long. There's a ton of wonderful stuff to learn about it. I've just given you the basics. Why am I talking about the editor now when the question was about the command line? Because one of the nice things about learning Vim is that many of those commands work fine on the command line. So how do I get, right now, let's pretend that I'm in an editor. I'm typing and it's going onto the screen. So that is as if I am in insert mode, right? So this is kind of a semantic thing. Or I'm definitely not in an editor. But if I had to say that my command line has two modes just like Vim, you would all tell me I'm in insert mode right now because anything I type ends up going into, uh, appears on the screen. How do I get into command mode? In Vim. Hit escape. That works, actually works, right here on the command line. I can hit escape. How do I go up in my editor? J is down. K is up. So let me do K. K, K, K. See, I'm seeing all my previous commands. If I find one that I, I'm happy with, I can just hit return. And now I have another one of those directories sitting here. Uh, so I can go K, 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 K. Uh, and then to go to the right is L. So maybe I want to come over here. I can do CW to change word. And I can change what it is I'm doing. Hit return and it executes it. Okay. So all of the features you have in your editor, you actually, not all, but many of the basic features that you have in your editor, you have on your command line as well. So once you get, you may have noticed that I can kind of crank through commands pretty fast, and that's just simply because I'm familiar with Vim, and I'm taking advantage of Vim commands to quickly edit my command line. Uh, let's see. How am I getting some things typed fast? There's something called auto-completion. So what I can do is I can type the first <coughs> few characters of a file that I'm interested in. So let's say I want to... CD into uh, this 2014 directory. I can type just one or two or three characters, 20, and if I hit the tab key, 
I am in insert mode. I haven't gone to um, command mode, but I'm it, it, I'm using these terms loosely. I would never on the command line say I'm in insert mode, but in Vim terms, I'm in insert mode. So I'm typing a two. I type a zero. If I type a tab, it will see if there's anything in my current directory matching what I'm typing, and if there is, it'll complete it for me. Okay. Uh, the very two, just two. Yes. What if there's what if there is multiple things? So let me add another one, which is uh, I'll create a 2014 Todd. Now, if I do an LS, I've got a directory called 2014.0124, and I've got a file called 2014 Todd. Uh, if I type 20 and I hit tab, oh, that didn't work the way I was hoping. Hang on. If I type uh, CD20, it stops as soon as it. Uh, hits the part where it becomes unique. Now there are a couple things I can do at this point. If I know that I say want the T for Todd to make it unique, I can type T and hit tab and it'll finish it. If I don't know, so I've hit this, I get to 2014. If I don't know and I want to see, well, what's it confused about? I hit tab a second time and it tells me what it's stumbling over. And I can say, ah, oh, I wanted the, the T for Todd one. Hit type the T, hit tab, it finishes it up. Okay. In this case, that's not a directory, so it complains. Uh, the last thing I'll give you is that, as you saw, with th that there is a history kept of all of your commands that you've typed in. You can actually see everything that you've typed in. Just type history and hit return. And uh, so again, that, that ha is beneficial in and of itself. However, a couple more tricks. You, I can type an exclamation point in a number. So 506, the exclamation point 506 means redo command 506, which in this case is ls. If you can see that there, I hit return. It goes ahead and does that. The exclamation point is kind of a nice redo uh, command. If I type an exclamation point in V, that will redo the most recent command that I typed in that starts with the letter V. In this case, if I look up here, it's going to be 508 here. So that will redo this command here. I type hit return, and it reran them Etsy password. Uh, so in the long run, this will make your work a lot, lot faster. Because, as we'll see before too long, one way you're going to compile a program is you're going to say assignment 02.cpp-0 assignment 02. And that's an error. I don't have any such assignment. But um, let me ask a stop and ask a different question. Is that too low for anyone? Is this? Yeah, All right, let me do this. Say when. All right. Um, Without knowing the things I just told you, that means every time you end up compiling, recompiling, recompiling, recompiling as you're trying to work out bugs, and you see people sitting here doing this, right? And it's a whole lot of typing every time you want to compile. Instead, you just say uh, the, the word for exclamation point in Unix language is bang. So all I do is I say bang g, it reruns the last command that began with a g, and it reruns that whole compile line there. Okay. So nice shortcuts to to learn. All right, next question. Yes? Well, sorry, this is about the word because That's fine. I was just wondering, are they case sensitive at all? No, they're not case sensitive. Okay. Um, for the last box, I mean, I don't think you're going to be doing the timer anymore, but if you had to strike down the time for it, but the, the timer doesn't work, you, you can think of 117 in your video, like 117 in your video is just a minute and 17. Right, right. So the the yeah. So they um, okay. Two things about writing down the time. First of all, I was only having you. I was only making a big deal about the time for the sake of being able to easily find that particular word. Uh, it is the time on the clock. It's not the duration of the recording. So you do have to you do have to do a little hunting where you drag a little bit, let go, and see what time of day it's showing on the screen there, right? And kind of hone in on it that way. 
Um, but that said, it, my recommendation still stands for general note taking where you're far, uh, to my belief, you're far better off to, whenever I say something that you want to make note of, to write the current time of day in a couple notes of why you're writing the current time of day. So, other questions? Okay. Okay, so I'll leave this like yeah, yeah. Whoops. Okay, so there's an example of where I had a typo, so let me go through what I did as so I hit escape, I hit a K that took me to my command. I had misspelled remove directory. I have two, D, two D's here. So all I did is I got K to this command. I hit LL to go to the right a couple times and I hit X to delete that errant character and then I just hit return again. Okay, so that's an example of me taking advantage of all that to speed things up. Uh, here I'll type, again I'm looking at this one file I don't want in here anymore so I'm going to type remove two and I'll just hit tab. That'll complete it. Well gone. All right. Uh, for just a moment, I want to show in parallel what's happening graphically with what I'm doing on the command line. Um, sometimes it is a little bit. Oh, let me see. Hang on. Let me see. <coughs> All right. So if I type PWD, whoops, PWD, I am in users T Gibson Chico da 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 da, and I'm in this 201401124 directory, and that is this in GUI terminology. I'd say it's this folder. All right. If I make a directory, and I'm going to call that directory um, Gold. Okay, I'll make another one. Now I can go ahead and change directories into silver. And maybe I will make a directory here called bronze. And maybe I'll create a file, uh, Todd's file.txt. And I'll write, hi there, folks. Now, recall that now my current directory on this command line is inside of silver. So I created bronze and I created this file inside of the silver directory. So if I come over here and I double click, there they are. Okay. So just in case this is a little bit scary and a little bit abstract, you are actually doing the things that you know and love at the graphical user interface level, creating folders, creating files. What is my, in the context of, of the language I'm using, my current directory for this window here is silver. If I want to go up to the parent directory, I click up here and I just drag right there and I've just gone to the parent directory, yes? Here, I go to the parent directory by doing cd dot dot. And if I see what's in the parent directory, it's gold and silver. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence for all this stuff. All right, any questions on that? Yes? It's going back, I would, the terminology I would use is it's going to, into the parent directory, the directory above the one you're currently in. Uh, also, I, I never did say it explicitly, but you have what is referred to as a home directory. So these, uh, the Unix and Linux operating systems are what are referred to as multi-user operating systems. You can have dozens, hundreds of people working on the same computer at the same time. They obviously have their own uh, terminal window or even graphical environments in this day and age. Uh, but, but they are all on the same machine. So the way, what needs to be divvied up then to separate users is disk space, yes? And so uh, each person 
would get their own folder or in the other terminology would get their own directory and that's referred to as your home directory. It is the directory that you appear in when you log into that machine and in fact if you're in the the Mac world uh, you'll notice if you have it here that there's a, a little house here next to T. Gibson and that's where this uh, icon comes from is this term of referring to it as the home directory. Uh, an easy way for you to, regardless of where you are, so if I type PW, here, let me stretch this back up. If I type PWD uh, to print my working directory, I'm inside of Users T. Gibson Chico courses. I'm way down here, right? Uh, one thing that is fairly common to want to do is to get all the way back to your home directory. Based on what I've told you so far, it would be I want to go up to the 111S14 directory, up to the courses directory up to the Chico directory, up to T. Gibson, which is my home directory. Yeah, a lot of kind of eyeballing and figuring out how high you have to go. There's a shortcut to get to your home directory. If you type CD and no other information, meaning you do not provide anything over here, then that will automatically take you to your home directory. Uh, another thing that's very con yes, that's fine. Uh, the VIM is uh, the programmer's editor. So what, when I did it back a ways right here? Yeah. What I did is, uh, so retracing my steps, I created a gold and a silver directory, then I moved down into the silver directory. Inside of the silver directory, I created a bronze directory. And then here, I wanted to create a file. And uh, the way I chose to create a file is to edit using Vim, again that's our programmer's editor, to edit a file called toddsfile.txt and I mean I can well, uh, reenactment Vim, toddsfile.txt. What I did is I went in here, I just typed some gobbledygook and then I wrote out the file and that's what suddenly made that file exist in the file system. And then I quit the editor. And so that's what I was doing right here. Then I went up to the parent directory, ls, so on and so forth. So it's like making a file with them. Yes, so, so it, it's just like Microsoft Word. The, the equivalent statement would be, I am going to make a file with Microsoft Word. How do you do that? You bring up Microsoft Word, you type some stuff, and you go to save, yes? And there is nothing in your, in your file system until you do that saves. Exact same thing with Vim. You don't get anything actually out in the file system until you do that with this finger, because if you're a touch typist, that's your W, until you write out the file, yes? Uh, I don't know how to we use like the uh, binary term. It doesn't matter if it's Vim or binary term. What was the other one? Uh, Vim editor. Vim editor? Yeah. Uh, they're the same. Vim editor or. Well, Vim is Vim is Vim. How, how is Vim editor different from Vim? W were you seeing something different than what I'm doing here? No, but uh, when you type in uh, Windows. Between the Vim that I'm doing in the Vim on Jaguar or in the other in the lab? Yeah. No, just as Microsoft Word on your computer and Microsoft Word on my computer are exactly the same. Uh, so let me talk just a, a moment about. Oh, and then one last, uh, the very last thing I want to talk about as far as navigating around the system here. Uh, it's it's common to want to bounce between two directories and it would be given that I was down here uh, it, it would be a pain for me to say CD all this stuff and then CD to go back to the home directory and then CD all this stuff now we can speed it up a little bit with like that bang command stuff I showed you or hit escape a K a few times to go up to it and hit return but there is a faster way if I do CD and a dash that means go back to the previous directory you were just in I was previously in this directory here, so if I do that, I end up there. Now, what was the previous directory I was just in? No. The home directory, so let me try it. There I am, home directory. You see how it just toggles back and forth between the two most recent directories? So when you have to do that kind of thing, uh, that version of CD helps you. Okay. All right, yes? Uh, for the class, are you going to 
force us to have to use or force us to have to use um, Vim, or can we use a different command line at a variable choice, or even a, do we want? Do we want? Uh, so the question is whether I'm going to force you to use Vim or whether a different editor is acceptable. And that is a very interesting question. Uh, I will not be grading you on using Vim. Um, Yeah, I, I, I'm pausing for a moment trying to think if I ever want to have a quiz where I'm quizzing you on Vim, and I'm thinking that I probably won't. So you all are going, yes, Vim goes by the wayside. A couple things. Um, it, me doing Vim is actually my choice. You're not going to find any document in the Department of Computer Science here that says all 111 students shall you learn Vim. Okay, So you are the unlucky people in my section whom I'm, quote unquote, forcing to use Vim. Go to the other section, they probably got some version of text edit where you just bring it up and click the mouse and type your code, all right? I have one guarantee for you, and, and people have come back to me and said, yes, you're absolutely right, over and over again. You use Vim, suffer through it, get to the end of the semester. When you go in 211, you're gonna be sitting next to that student that's in the other section you will write code twice as fast as they do. That's my guarantee. So that's my sales pitch. You can take it or leave it. Also keep in mind that I do revisit Vim several times through the semester, so there will be times where you're twiddling your thumbs if you're not using Vim and everyone's avidly learning the next cool trick on using the editor. All right? Okay. Um, other questions? Okay. So let's talk a, a little bit about the concept of programs running on a machine. So you double click, what we're all uh, certainly familiar with is you double click on Microsoft Word and it's running. And we're also very comfortable in the world where you can run more than one thing at once. So you can double click on Excel and be running that and maybe you have some solitaire running and you have all these programs running. Okay, when you're double clicking on them, what you're doing is you're asking uh, your operating system, in the example I'm giving here, it's Microsoft Windows, what you're asking Windows to do is to go out to its disk, find where that program is laid out on disk, and bring it into main memory, into random access memory, and then start it running. And what the operating system is doing is it's ask, acting like the master juggler where you want to run 10 things at once and it's making sure you can do all 10 things at once. Okay? Uh, a program cannot run while it's sitting on disk. Why do we have disks and now we're moving away from disks and we're starting to move into solid state drives? The reason we have those at all is because once I turn off the computer, anything that's in main memory is gone. Right? So you need a way of that to be preserved during blackouts and when you walk away for a few days and so forth. Um, so that's why we have that storage there, uh, but it, you are unable to run it when it's actually sitting on storage. It does have to be in the main memory of the processor for it to actually manipulate it, work with it, and obey the commands that have been typed in for it. Using that as a backdrop, uh, the operating system itself is many, many programs running. So if I type PSWAUX, uh, I won't get into all the nuances of what I'm typing here, except to say that PS means look at the processes that are currently running on the machine. So this is my Macintosh. If I look at all the things that are running currently, that's the list. It went by a little fast. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put aside uh, the description of what I'm doing exactly except to say that what I want to do is get a count of the number of lines that just scrolled by. So I'm running the command again and counting the lines. So there are 200 things currently running on this little laptop sitting in front of me. Yes? Is that equivalent to Windows Task Manager? Type of uh, equivalent to Windows Task Manager, it sounds like it. Process. Yeah, the processes is the term, yes. So... Anything that's going is just a process. Interestingly enough, um, 
this thing right here that's giving me the dollar sign and is moving whenever I hit return, that is a process that is running on the computer. It is a process especially designed to, to look at the quote, look at the keyboard to see what I type in. And once I type something in, it then figures out what to do with it. So if I type LS and I hit return, what this process, if you will, this program that's running is doing is it's saying, oh, he just typed LS. What is LS? Is that something that I understand inside of me? No. Is there anything on the disk called LS? And it says, yes, by golly, there is something on the disk called LS. And so it takes that off the disk, puts it in main memory, and says, LS, do your thing. And LS knows what to do. It knows to look at the folder and, and print out everything that's in your current directory. Okay. Uh, this thing that's showing the dollar sign, what is that called? It's called a shell. And uh, sometimes you'll hear bash shell. That's The bash is just the flavor of shell. There are many, many different kinds of shells. Bash is, by and large, the most popular one these days. It used to be called, back in the day, it was just called SH, which meant shell. Uh, there have been many, many incarnations of the shell. They call this one bash because it's called born again shell. A little play on words there. So does the PS stand for uh, print screen? No, that stands for uh, process status. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and take a minute to tell you what I'm doing here, which is that. Um, Back in the old days, when I started programming, every Unix machine came with a manual on kind of half-sized sheets of paper. And every and you, you can no longer find them. But even back then, every page of that, and what each page of that manual described was one of these commands that you can type in, one of these programs that can on disk that can be run as a process. LS, the bash, uh, what are some others we've done? PS so on and so forth. It's all also available electronically. It was then, it was that now. So I can type man, which means manual. I can look at the manual page, the online manual page for LS. Now, a bit of a warning. It is a reference manual. It's not a tutorial. So it assumes that you already know what LS is, and you just need to find some little bit of trivia about the command. Uh, for instance, when I did PSWAUX, if I wanted to understand what the W, the A, the U, and the X meant, I could do a, a man on PS, and uh, I could go ahead and read through it. And here you see it has the, each of these options, and it's telling me what each is doing. That's kind of how I would use these man pages. I don't, I don't really expect you to be getting deep into the man pages, just throwing it out there. Okay, We'll probably revisit it later in the semester. Let me finish by talking uh, a little bit about C++. So C++ is a programming language. It's something that you use to make programs do things. Microsoft Word was written using a programming language. Um, you name it. Anything, anything running on a computer was done using a programming language. This, this shell, this thing called Bash, is a programming, was written with a programming language. PS, LS, all of those commands that we've been doing were all by some programmer sitting down writing a program called LS. All right? So that's what we're going to learn to do in here is write our own programs that do our own things. Uh, the process you use is to create your program in an editor. And this gets back to what editor? Let's use Vim. You may call the program anything you want. Don't have any spaces. So I will call this program first. C++ programs are sensitive to the extension, so uh, meaning what follows after the period. So I would put .cpp, which obviously stands for C++. Otherwise, things get confused downstream. So call this whatever you want. Uh, first, Todd, just end it with .c++. I hit return. I go into my editor. Now I'm going to give you a bit of a recipe.
Uh, what else do I need? Okay. I will, I'll come back and explain this in just a moment. By vir and this is all C++ code. By virtue of writing this C++ code, I do not yet have anything that the, comp that the computer can run. So I can type ls, and it does whatever ls is supposed to do, but I can't type first.cpp. It, it just, just doesn't work. Because this is a, what I referred to before as a text file, meaning it's a human-readable file. It's not machine-readable. So we have to go through a process of converting this, this human-readable file into something the machine understands, and that's what's called a compiler. So I'll, let me create some notes here. Again, what I do is all these files I create, I go ahead and I post to the announcement, so you don't have to sc scribble furiously. You can just wait till I post the announcement and grab the file that I typed in. Uh, steps in compiling. One, create a file, or let me say edit, edit slash create a file with a .cpp extension. Two, compile that file. What is a compiler? Uh, there are different compilers for different languages. For us, it's G++. And then you provide the name of your C++ code, which is first.cpp. And again, I'll take advantage of these shortcuts at the shell, and I'll just hit the tab key, let it finish. Next, I need to give my program a name. So that's done with dash O. The O stands for output, meaning that this compiler is going to, to take this as input, is going to convert it into something the machine can understand, and now we, it has to put that somewhere. It's going to put it back on disk, the machine-readable version. We don't lose this. We just get a machine-readable version. And you can call it anything you want. By custom, you generally give it the same name without the .cpp extension, you're under no obligation to do that. You call it whatever you want. Okay, yes? Is that like, does it turn it into binary? It turn, yes, so to say it turns it into binary is an uh, inaccurate statement. One thing about, that you may have started noticing about Linux and Unix is whenever you do something correctly, it gives you no feedback at all. Okay? <laughs> It's not, yeah, that's right. It's not going to, you know, give you a little chuck on the chin there and say, good job. Um, it's, it's just going to shut up and let you do your thing. So this did not give me any feedback at all. That means it worked great. Let's do ls to see what we have here. Here's my old gold silver directories that I did earlier in the class. Here's the notes where I started writing the steps for compiling a program. Here's the program I just wrote that had the hello world. And this right here, note, is exactly the same as what I had following the dash O. And that is the program I can run. So now, in order to run this, I have to say, uh, I, I have to write the program I have to run. Say where it is that I want to run it. It's in my current directory, and it's called first. Hit return, and it runs that program. Okay. Yes? Now, the, the first program that you wrote seemed like a pretty simple program. When you start getting into really more complex programs, are we going to be using a debugger to go through those? Or? Right. Uh, so the question is, as we get into more advanced programs, are we going to utilize a debugger to help us? Uh, what a debugger is... So as, as programs get large, and they do get large, uh, I'm sure that, for instance, Microsoft Word, if we were to look at the source code, there would be hundreds of thousands, probably millions of lines of code. Um, and I imagine everyone's used software where it's crashed all of a sudden, something's gone wrong with it. Those are bugs. 
right? And when you got millions of lines of code, it's really hard to find those bugs. So there's something called a debugger, which helps you step through. It's kind of neat because it'll, you can have, depending on the debugger, you can have your source code sitting on one side and the program running on the other, and it'll actually step through and show you the lines it's doing. You can stop it and interrogate it and ask it questions. It's a beautiful thing. I am not, I think things for the most part stay simple enough that I am not going to introduce you to the debugger. I am going to introduce you to ways to figure out what's wrong with your program, but I'm not going to formally look at a debugger. In 2.11, Tyson does explicitly take time to teach you how to use a debugger. Yes? The compiler will give you tips about what's wrong. However, uh, the compiler is just the first line of defense. Let me, let me tell you what I, I mean. Oops. Uh, I want to vim first.cpp. All right, I'm going to introduce a bug in here. I put a little x there, that said int. If I try compiling this, and what I'll do is I'll go up to my previous g++ command. All right, so the, the question was uh, implied, do you really need a debugger because the compiler just told you that something was wrong? The issue isn't with the compiler. It turns out, so you all are going to struggle with errors on the compiler all the time, but when you become fluent in the language, that means that you can make programs compiled, meaning that I do the G++ command and it comes back with no problems. Compiling ends up being the easy thing as a software engineer. What's the hard thing is the program that compiles just fine and seems to be running and doing its thing, and then all of a sudden it just bombs out, and you don't know where in that million lines of code it bombed out. Uh, so the debugger is for programs that compile just fine, and you need to see what's wrong while they're running. The compiler is going to help you out if you've written a program that is not proper C++. Okay? I, am, I have got 60 seconds, so I don't really have time to explain this. Let me just describe then what I would like you to do between now and, and Monday. Uh, I will get assignment two up. Assignment two is to write what I would call a simple program in length. It's probably going to be four times as long as what you see on the screen here. Uh, I, in addition to taking a look at that assignment, I would start, uh, assignment two will also have some resources to go to. So what you need to do is start going to those resources, learning exactly what each of these little lines are that I typed in. Try experimenting with your own programs. And then come here on Monday with a lot of questions to ask me. Okay. Thank you.